thank you everybody for being here. Um, I wish you were actually, I, I wish this would be in presence, but uh, this is the best next thing. Uh, I see a, a, a lot of very friendly faces, so I hope, uh, I hope, um, I hope uh, I can see more of more of you more often. But okay, this is what we have. Um, all right. So since the uh, ISCP started with uh, with some publicity, I would like to do my my also my publicity here to begin with. And this is a let's see. This is a symposium that we have organized uh, for the next meeting of the Society for Neuroscience in Chicago in October. And I just wanted everybody to know this in case you're interested in the, um, in the topic that we will uh, I will discuss today. And in case you <clears throat> plan to go to Chicago for this meeting, this incredible meeting that happens every year. It's a, just an amazing, uh, an amazing meeting for size, for its variety, for the diversity of topics and there's everything. There's something for everybody there. So I encourage everybody to pay attention to this meeting and to go go if you if you can. All right, so I will uh, frustrate on reward, which is the topic of that symposium that we organized. Um, it's also the topic of my of my talk, but I will center on a, a learning phenomenon that's recognized as successive negative contrast. It's, been around for a long time, almost a hundred years. Uh, first, the first uh, couple of papers were published in 1928. So we are we are approaching the hundredth anniversary of, of this, and we're still looking for uh, what factors trigger this this effect. And in in particular, we are in my lab. We are interested in the uh, neural network that's activated by this uh, this violation of of expectancies that's, uh, that's uh, in the core of, of, of this effect. I'll describe this effect extensively. All right, so let's begin in an unusual way. I was reading The Ethics uh, by Aristotle, and I came across this passage, um, which I can't see because there's something there. All right, um, okay. Uh, he says, oh, he wrote, uh, yet the absolute or substance is prior to is prior in nature to the relative, which seems to be an offshoot of, or accident of the substance, so that uh, there cannot be a common idea corresponding to the absolutely good and the relatively good. And this, of course, Aristotle was not talking about incentive relativity at all, but this, this uh, the, the combination of absolute and relative words caught my attention. And so I asked myself a few things. Um, uh, first, let's see what, what the key ideas are in this passage from the, uh, the Nicomachean ethics. Um, he says that absolute good comes before relative good. And then he says that there are no common ideas between these goods. Um, and I, I suggest that we think of this or I suggest that we can think of this in evolutionary terms, which is not what Aristotle had in mind, because there's no evolutionary thinking in, in, in the ancient uh, philosophers. So can we think of this in evolutionary terms? And then can we, can we consider relative incentive value as involving something unique? So I'm taking the spirit of Aristotle's quote here, but I, I'm, I'm departing uh, substantially from what he had in mind. So this is interesting, though has been interesting for a number of people, very prominent people who uh, most of us, most of you probably know. And I'll, I'll be looking at this screen over here, so don't think that I'm not paying attention to you. Uh, it's I have a bigger screen over here. So the person who did most of the contributions to frustrating on war and even named the, the phenomenon frustrating on war was Abe Amser. And his research was mainly focused on the partial reinforcement extinction event, but also he looked at developmental, uh, the developmental uh, emergence of uh, the PRE and a number of related phenomena, and also look at the neurobiology of 
uh, uh, so, um, frustrated on rewards. So he is a pioneer um, in this field. Also, also in this field, you have, if you search for it, you have contributions from Alan Wagner before he became uh, famous for uh, because of the Roscola Wagner model, by Jeffrey Gray, who looked at uh, the connection, as well as Wagner, uh, they both look at the connection between fear and frustration uh, before, before I think, before anybody else did. Uh, Jeff Peterman, who did a, a number of research uh, experiments with uh, species that are not typical of the psychological lab, like fish and turtles, and who I consider one of my mentors. And uh, then there is Helen Daly. I couldn't find a picture of her. So what I did is I put a picture here of the paper, a her paper that I consider to have influenced me substantially. It's, it's a paper on the uh, uh, phenomenon of escape from frustration in rats. And it's also in connection to uh, the successive negative contrast with them. Charlie Flaherty did research on the pharmacology of uh, SNCs, successive negative contrast, and um, extensive research really great contributions by, by Flaherty. Um, and then my longtime uh, collaborator, Alba Mustaka, who we lost uh, tragically this 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 year. And um, she's done tremendous amount of work uh, on the on the basis of um, successive negative contrast. SNC, I will just say SNC for now. So these people contributed substantially and um, and let's see, let's see how we can start this uh, this uh, narrative by looking at um, first the absolute and then the relative. So, how do we assess the absolute value of an incentive? I ask that question all the time, and I love Detroit style pizza. So, here is an assessment of two magnitudes of this this fantastic piece of food, a whole pizza versus a slice. See, if you ask me, you know, I'd rather have the whole pizza than the slice. And we 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 use rats in our research, we don't give them pizza, but we give them something that will to a rat be equivalent to what this uh, Detroit style pizza is to me. And that is a sucrose solution of very high concentration. We use typically we use 32% sucrose, which is very, very sweet. And if you put a rat for a number of sessions to drink from a tube, the tube that, that delivers 32% um, uh, sucrose, what you're gonna see is a rat leaking after 10, 10 trials. And it's only a fraction of, a, of, a, of the whole section, just a few seconds. And there's not much to see here because what the animal is doing almost the entire five minutes, that's the length of the session, is to leak from the tube. And it leaks at a fantastic speed. And maybe you can appreciate that at the end of the video when you see the animal leaking at a very high rate there. So this is what the animal, an animal like a rat does with 32% sucrose. Um, and this, this shows how much the animal appreciates the reward. It will go kind of an absolute value it has, a very high one. Now, if you if you do if you put this problem in a comparative perspective, um, then beginning with the research from Elliot in 1928, and this, this, this is the original data from that experiment in a mice in a maze, uh, in a maze situation with two different kinds, two different qualities of reward, one more preferred uh, by rats than the other. The preferred one generates fewer errors than the less preferred one. And if you repeat this with a number of species like toads and goldfish and uh, and turtles and uh, birds, you get typically you will get not always, but typically you will get um, faster learning, better performance, uh, uh, fewer errors, shorter latencies, and so on for uh, responding to a large reward than for responding to a small reward. And so this is uh, this is kind of not surprising, but uh, uh, but remember that these we're going to look at where these animals come from because we think that these animals come from our vivarium, but no, they come from a lineage of animals that 
I can be traced back to a very long evolutionary period. We can explain most of this with a very simple assumption, like I, I call here uh, that assumption, the strengthening, weakening assumption. Uh, it's kind of like Truscola Wagner, uh, reinforcement strengthens the value of a stimulus and non-reinforcement weakens it. There's nothing particularly complicated about this sort of behavior. But let's look at the, where these animals come from. And here's a, here's a, a phylogenetic tree based upon uh, molecular data. <clears throat> and what I want to show is, uh, we, don't, we don't have here the same animals that I showed you in this previous slide, but we have lineages, which I mark here with a red arrow. So for example, we don't have evidence of contrast in tilap, in, in not denial tilapia. Um, but we have evidence of contrast from bony fish to two or three species of bony fish. So that's that's what I'm uh, intending to do here. And when you look at these uh, species that we have used in these experiments, uh, people have used in these experiments, um, although the species cannot be tracked down for a long evolutionary period, the lineages can to some extent be tracked in uh, in terms of molecular evidence and in terms of paleontological evidence. And when you do that, you see that the divergence of lineages leading to bony fish from the lineage leading to tetrapods um, occurs sometime in the, in the Paleozoic era, uh, more, about 400 million years ago. And the divergence of animals that now we recognize as amphibians from the uh, rest of the tetrapods occur about 350 million years ago, also in the Paleozoic. And the divergence of marsupial mammals from placentals occur sometime in the Jurassic. There's evidence of placental mammals from the Jurassic, which is impressive, uh, 160 million years ago. So these lineages come from uh, evolutionary events that happen hundreds of millions of generations ago. And so there has been plenty of opportunity for these, uh, these uh, lineages to evolve divergent mechanisms of learning. And so when you see the corresponding behavioral data that I showed you before and see that pretty much everybody, everybody in that picture responds better for a large reward than for a small reward, you, you wonder the extent to which you will have common me underlying mechanisms. And that wouldn't be surprising because obviously when the resource is food, because these animals all depend on food, it's not surprising that they uh, are willing to work more or to spend more energy uh, learning and reaching out for larger amounts of reward than they are for smaller amounts. So uh, keep this evolutionary framework in mind as we progress. So how do we assess relative value of incentives? Well, again, I have my 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 pizza here, and my the, the I, I I am really um, I really don't have any major aversions to food, but I don't like radish for some reason. Um, not that I have tried them, but to me, if you if you switch me from if if you tell me they're gonna you're gonna give me pizza, and then you give me radish, that would be a major uh, discrepancy, a major disparity between what I expect, given what you told me, and what I got, given what I see in front of me. So we want to compare the behavior of animals that have just been uh, given a surprising downshift in reward to that of animals that never had any other experience. In this case, animals that had something equivalent to radish. And so I'm gonna show you how the same rat that you saw before responds in a situation in which the sucrose solution that used to be 32%, extremely uh, sweet, is now devalued to 4%. And I want you to see three things. First of all, in this video, again, is, is a section for brevity. Um, I want you to see that it takes a little while for the animal to pick up that there is a difference between what was happening before and what's happening now. 
in fact, we measure that in our lab, and we know that it takes, in our situation, it takes about 100 seconds for the animal to perceive the difference or to react to the difference uh, in, in, uh, to the disparity in rewards. Uh, keep in mind that the animal is getting one reward, but the other reward is, has information about the previous reward has to be retrieved from memory. This is not a comparison of rewards that are occurring simultaneously, but it's a comparison between a current reward with something that the animal uh, has come to expect because of prior experience. So it has to retrieve that information from memory, and maybe that's what it makes the delay in the picking up of the difference, the, the 100, uh, 100 seconds that I mentioned before. That's one thing. The second thing I want you to uh, notice how the animal goes away from the zipper tool. It does it, I think, in a way that we would describe as very energetic. And the third thing I want you to pick up from this short video is that the disparity triggers a, a rush of search behavior. The animal moves around a lot, comes back to the zipper tube, and then goes, goes out of it, away from it. And so it, it involves this kind of search behavior. So here's the video. So we want to understand what's happening in the brain of an animal that's exhibiting this sort of behavior, that's rejecting a solution. You, we know from uh, plenty of experiments that the rejection is transitory, is transient. So if you put the animal back on the next day, it will reject typically, a uh, typical animal will reject a little less and a little less the next day and so on until the behavior of uh, the downshifted animal comes to meet the behavior of the unshifted control. So this successive negative contrast, S and C, is a transient rejection of a reward that has been devalued. And by devalued, I mean uh, there have been has been downshifted, has been uh, has been reduced in in quantity in this case. Um, so now we look at, again at the same graph that I showed you before. And I want I want you to see what happens uh, with uh, with uh, all the animals except for the rats on the top left panel and the um, the bird uh, uh, on the on the on the right, not the pigeon, but the uh, I can't remember this the name of this bird. Okay, so I want you to look at this. For example, I want you to look at the amphibian data. Uh, because it's, it's typical of what you see in a lot of uh, non-mammalian vertebrates. Uh, you, you get the difference between the large and the small reward. This is, uh, this is, these are toes responding for water. Toes are incredibly sensitive to the uh, loss of water. And so this is a very, uh, very uh, important resource for them, a uh, matter of life and of death. But when you take the large reward and you downshift it to the small reward, what you see is a gradual adjustment of behavior without any kind of overshooting. And that graduate adjustment, which you see in other cases, um, can, can still be described by this strengthening weakening rule. So this is consistent with, say, the Roscola Wagner model. What, what that model cannot explain is this, what happens to the behavior of a rat under similar conditions. And what happens is the rat, uh, after a few trials, in which it experiences the downshifted reward, it comes to reject. These animals were trained in a complicated maze. And so what they do is they enter into other uh, blind alleys that were eliminated before when the animal was learning the, the location of the, of the, of the gold bombs. And this difference between, between the, the two conditions, between the two groups, this difference here is the S and C effect. Notice that at this point, they are all getting uh, access to a small reward or to the less preferred reward in this case, sunflower seeds. So, uh, so the difference in behavior cannot be attributed to current factors. It has to be attributed to whatever happened before, the prior experience. 
And so that's in that sense, we talk about expectations. The animal has learned because of prior uh, experience, has learned an expectation. What is it that it needs to get in, in the goal box? When that expectation is violated in a negative way, because there's a negative disparity, then the animal responds by rejecting the, the reward, even though normally it would be acceptable, as shown by the unshifted control, which always gets the small reward, um, it, it will now be, be rejected. So this is the effect of what we're trying to do. Now, I wish things would be more consistent in an evolutionary term, in evolutionary terms, but when you look at research with um, with this bird, what is this bird? Um, I can't remember. Well, okay, it, this research was done in England. And when, starling. Uh, starling, thank you, Aaron. Starlings. Uh, Research with starlings in a consumatory situation, all this is instrumental, but this one is consumatory. In a consumatory situation, you see this. I'll, I'll come back to the frustration idea. You see this. You see a nice, beautiful example of successive negative contrast. The animals that were uh, fed uh, preferred food now reject the less preferred one, and the effect is transient. As you can see, there. eventually the behavior goes away. Now, for rats, we had an incredible amount of research showing that an emotional response accompanies this, this SNC phenomenon. And traditionally, we call that response of, you know, facing an, a surprising or unexpected uh, reward downshift. We, we call it frustration. We call it primary, following answer, we call it primary and secondary frustration. And so we we think, I think that Sometime in the uh, evolution of the mammalian lineage, there has been a change that allow for uh, for uh, surprising losses in, in rewards to be tagged as emotionally important and to the, to the point that uh, the anticipation of those uh, events, the anticipation of failure to obtain the reward um, provokes a, an inhibition of approach behavior, as we'll see also provokes the uh, searching of alternative sources of reward. Whether that's true also for starlings or other birds, not for, for pigeons don't seem to show that, but uh, whether that's uh, true for starlings, we don't know because the only evidence that we have of contrast in, in starlings is this one that I'm showing you here, as far as I can tell. And so perhaps I was thinking that perhaps somebody watching this talk would become sufficiently interested to look into, into this problem. What we need here is a, sort of a mechanistic analysis of this effect, see what it means. Especially interesting will be to find out what uh, what happens in the brain of a, of a starling uh, or a similar bird. Um, what happens in the brain? What's, what's the circuitry that allows the animal to produce this sort of behavioral effect? Kind of like what we're trying to do with rats. All right. so. Uh, because the other uh, data that I show you from Iliad was so old, uh, 1928, I wanted to show you something that we just published 2024 with a group of uh, colleagues from Argentina and uh, in physiology and behavior. And this, these are two ways of producing SNC in rats, but now in a runway, much, a much simpler uh, apparatus that allows us to measure uh, Latencies near the start during the running on, on the major, in the large uh, section of the runway, and then near the goal. And the uh, graphs that you see on the left are all coming from training that involves a single trial per day, like it was the case for Elliot's data, the, the, other, the 1928 data, one trial per day. So this is widely spaced reasons, there are theoretical reasons for. Uh, performing the experiment under widely spaced uh, training trials. And what uh, you see on the right is also the same effect, but now uh, coming from training under relatively mass uh, conditions. Um, these, these are sessions involving four trials per, per session per day and uh, with, a very, with a very relatively short uh, inter-trial interval. And you can see that, <clears throat> you can see the overshooting that I mentioned before, especially in the runtime measure. So the animals reject the uh, goal, 
they, they don't want to approach the, the wall, let's say, in an anthropomorphic way. They, they refuse to go into the wall, right? But the, but the effect is transient. Eventually, they actually recover normal behavior. That doesn't happen in the controls that are getting, uh, that are getting unshifted uh, conditions of reinforcement. 16 and two uh, refer to num the number of pellets, the numbers of pellets per trial. And, uh, okay, so this is an effect that's uh, not, so, not so easy to obtain. Because in this paper, if you go to it, uh, you'll find that there are many conditions that we explore and it only occurs under very specific conditions. Like these two are the most, the most uh, effective conditions that produce, uh, produce, uh, produce evidence of contrast. For example, in the mass training condition, if you do 16 pellets to one, then you lose the effect. And presumably you lose the effect because one pellet per trial supports very, very little behavior. And, and so it's, it's in part because of the control. Uh, okay. And so the latencies, the latencies are very high. And so it's very hard to overshoot them. What about consumatory contrast? Here are data that Alba, Mustaka, and Jeff Biederman and I collected a long time ago, 1988. It was published in Animal Learning and Behavior before it changed its name. And we used two species of marsupials. Uh, both opossums from Argentina. The Delphis albiventris is, is in the same genus as the North American opossum. And this Lutriolina classical data is a, it's a more, car more of a carnivore marsupial. And they both accepted, for, to, my, to my surprise, accepted the 32% sucrose that was used with rats. And they accepted also the 4% sucrose, sucrose that uh, were used for the downshift. And uh, we did four downshifts, and I show you only two here. And you can see where the uh, red arrows are. You can see the evidence for contrast. Now, marsupial mammals, uh, like I said before, had diverged from, were already part of their own lineage, different from that lineage uh, leading to the placental mammals uh, in the Jurassic. So again, there has been plenty of uh, opportunities for the evolution of uh, alternative ways of dealing with reward loss that apparently didn't happen as far as behavior can tell us, but we don't really know if the underlying mechanisms uh, at the uh, neural level are the same. So that's what I'm aiming at. All right, so how do we understand this? Well, let's analyze the situation in, in part, in junks. Um, you have a zipper tube and the, you have uh, the animal leaking the zipper tube. When it leaks and it gets an outcome that we can define as 2% sucrose, this is the outcome that we normally use nowadays. 2% um, sucrose controls very little behavior, but it, it causes a very sharp uh, disparity when you go from 32 to two. And, and the, this is an animal that has received 32% sucrose for 10 days. And now it comes into the situation and gets 2% sucrose. And, we can see what happens in this way. Uh, I use the lambda uh, and, and V uh, from the Ruscola Weimer model just to make connections with, with people who might be familiar with that. Uh, the information about the current reward goes into, into a comparator. And we think that information also goes into retrieving the memory of the previous reward. And we, we, we think that maybe there is a small contribution of that uh, memory retrieval process from the zipper tube or something connected to the situation. But we have done experiments involving context manipulations that were very, that produced contrast but very, very weak evidence of contrast. So we don't think, we think that once the rat tastes the solution, the sucrose is kind of like me tasting the Detroit style pizza, you know, everything else disappears and that's the only thing that, I, that we can see. The rats are the same. And so that information, that reactivated memory of the pre-shift um, concentration, that's an expectation. This is why the E is there. That feeds into this comparator also. And the comparator is meant to compare uh, actual with expected rewards, the lambda versus V. And when that comparison leads to a negative disparity, then 
then we will have the contrast effect if the disparity is substantial. And Santiago Pellegrin and I did research varying, systematically varying the concentrations before and after the, uh, the, the shift. And we found that a post pre ratio less than 0.19 will give us substantial suppression of consumatory behavior. And what happens when you get that suppression? Well, we think that uh, an emotion that we can call primary frustration following AMSO, uh, a, a, an unconditioned response to the disparity is, is, uh, is activated. And that has two effects. On the one hand, it inhibits leaking, as you saw in the video. On, on the other hand, it triggers uh, patterns of search behavior. We think that this searching component uh, probably tells us something about the adaptive value of negative emotions like frustration, in the sense that uh, the negative emotion helps the animal breaking an attachment with the site that used to produce food, but no longer does so, and drives the animal in alternative directions. We we don't have much evidence for that, but we think that could be the adaptive function of uh, a negative emotion like frustration. So there are three components to this little behavioral model. There is the reward comparison component. There is the emotional, the frustration component. And there is this other component that we call incentive disengagement component, which has, has to do with breaking the attachment and looking for alternative sources of of reward. And what we are trying to do now is trying to map this into the brain. It's not a simple task because the, the mapping is not going to be one to one. It's not going to be one structure to one psychological process. It's going to be more complicated than that, but that's what we're trying to do. So, so how does that work? Well, because of Steve Riley's research, we think that the gustatory thalamus has a lot to do with this lambda term it has, has to do with assessing the reward that the animal is actually consuming right now, the obtained reward. And uh, Steve also did research on the insular cortex, which we think may encode the memory of the solution that the animal receives, receives during the pre-shift trial, before the shift. And because of research that we performed here in my lab by Amanda Gleck and uh, Katsu Kawasaki, we think that the comparator, the comparator term is performed by basolateral amygdala neurons. And we, we, can, we can go through the evidence later on. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting evidence for that. I'll come back to that a little bit. And then, then there's two other things, right? So where is the emotion coming from? we think it's connected most importantly to the central nucleus of the amygdala. And this was uh, work done, uh, chemogenetic inhibition work done by Sara Warino. And the other part is something that has to do with the notion of incentive disengagement, which perhaps is connected to basal ganglia. That's a hypothesis that we have. We don't know for sure. And this is the, this idea of incentive disengagement is something that Carmen and, and I and together with Sarah and Chris uh, Hagen, they have developed it and have developed uh, uh, a few years ago. All right, so where are we? So now we can go back to Aristotle and be more specific, right? So these are the, the these are the key ideas, absolute before relative. Well, the mechanisms for absolute incentive value evolved before those of relative incentive value. How do we know, how can we test that? Well. Because animals that have the ability to respond differentially to different quantities or qualities of reward may not be able to respond in relative ways. And that will tell us that one set of traits, one set of mechanisms controlling the response to absolute reward value uh, have evolved before the, those mechanisms that we don't know yet much about that are engaged by a relative incentive value. And there, there is no common idea between these goods, the absolute and the relative value. Well, the idea that we have here is that mammals evolve brain mechanisms that tag negative reward disparity with aversive value. This we call incentive disengagement. So we think that 
we think that detecting reward relativity requires negative emotion. That in, in the very detection of the phenomenon, the animal has to produce negative uh, emotion like frustration. We think that's true, but we don't know whether that's true. Because, for example, uh, in this case, the Starling data could, could be very helpful. For example, if, if you could show that you could get, there are ways of getting negative contrast, successive negative contrast that are not emotionally based. For example, there's a way based upon generalization decrement. So the situation looks so different from the way it used to be that I don't know what's going on. Uh, and so it's a more of a cognitive or associative mechanism unconnected or less related to emotion. So it's possible that some examples of contrast, particularly when you have training under uh, mass conditions of training, uh, it, it, it's possible that you will get, you will get uh, behaviorally the same effect, but based upon very different underlying mechanisms. All right, so, but we think that if you're gonna get, uh, especially under space trial conditions, if you're gonna get S and C, you're gonna have to have negative emotion. All right, so Carmen and Leo Ortega and I and uh, have, have been working on this and published a paper that included this, this uh, complicated circuitry. And what I'm about to show you here is a sort of a modified version of that circuit. And it contains first a circuit for the taste leaking model action pattern which is integrated at the level of the, of, the, of the brainstem. And imagine that you separate the brainstem from the rest of the brain. The animal should still be able to leak for sucrose uh, without problem, although it may not produce contrast. It may not respond by suppressing leaking uh, when, the, when you downshift the solution. Uh, but this is not working in isolation in the regular brain when the rest of the brain is attached to the brainstem, this work go goes into three different modes. It goes into reward comparison, emotion, and action. And here are some of the elements. And uh, please, please keep in mind that this is an extremely simplistic way to look at this, because as you know, the brain is far more complicated than what you're about to see here. So here is the connection between the, uh, this nucleus here, the parabrachial nucleus, that leaves, leaves collaterals that go into the central nucleus of the amygdala, but also into the gustatory thalamus. And this gustatory thalamus, as I mentioned before, is supposed to give us information about what, what is the animal testing right now. But it, it's also supposed to reactivate neurons in the insular cortex that encode information about the large reward that the animal received in pre -ship. These two sources of information go into the BLA. The, B, the BLA is, we hypothesize um, that it should contain neurons that respond selectively to the downshift, that are silent unless the animal experiences a downshift. And from there, you get two major pathways, one that goes into the central nucleus of the amygdala and the other that goes into the accumbens. The accumbens is part of the reward system of the brain, but it's also part of the basal ganglia that controls action. And so we have from there, for, from the reward aspects of the accumbens, you get modulation of uh, central amygdala activity through the anterior cingulate and uh, the uh, infralimbic cortex, but also you get access to the basal ganglia, which is a very complicated uh, circuit that regulates action. And we think this this circuit is important. Uh, it's important with its output from the motor cortex. It's important to generate leaking. So this will this will be the circuit that generates leaking. For example, during during the uh, during the uh, pre shift trials, when the the disparity between obtained and expected is is equal to zero, the animal has come to expect what it gets. But when the disparity is negative, then the central nucleus of the uh, amygdala kicks in. And this means that it will inhibit the circuitry that controls leaking. And that's the connection there. But we also know that the central amygdala has other outputs. And there is one that we are interested in, which is connected to the lateral habenula and the VTA. 
as they regulate, these two regulate uh, the, the value of reward, especially the relative value of reward. All right, so let's concentrate. We can't do everything. So I'm going to concentrate on this, the DLA central amygdala, in other words, the amygdala. I'm gonna concentrate on the amygdala and we'll disregard other kinds of uh, experiments that we're currently running, especially in, in this area of the basal ganglia. So what can we say about the amygdala? Well, as I mentioned before, there's evidence from the amygdala that DLA lesions, these are excitotoxic lesions uh, that uh, depopulate the area, uh, the basolateral amygdala area. They, they show, they eliminate contrast basically. They don't eliminate the ability of animals to distinguish rewards as in the BLA group or to adjust their behavior, but they selectively eliminate the excessive adjustment that uh, comes with contrast, the contrast term. And for reasons that have to do with this paper here, uh, other, other research that we uh, collected in, in the course of this experiment, uh, we think that the BLA is connected to the actual comparison of obtained and expected rewards. And I'll show you some evidence for that. On the other hand, the amygdala, and this is a, a chemogenetic inactivation of the amygdala, uh, the central amygdala selectively, uh, you get this, this effect, you get, you get uh, the, the chemogenetic inactivation happens here in the post uh sessions. Uh, before you get the nice difference between 32 and 2% in both conditions. And then when you downshift from 32 to two, you get the expected uh, suppression of behavior in, in uh, vehicle animals, but those activated, those who get CNO, which is the activator drug for dreads, uh, for uh, designer receptors exclusively, exclusively activated by designer drugs, in this case, an inhibitory uh, uh, engineer receptor, they uh, completely eliminate the effect, the, con the contrast effect. Um, so this is part of the evidence. This, Plenty more evidence about the central nucleus of the amygdala, but this is this the most the most recent one that we have from 2020. All right, so here is some research by Yamamoto and colleagues in Japan who is not yet published, and I I saw the I saw a preview of the paper, and I thought that, I thought this is just fantastic. Um, these are these researchers are not interested in contrast. Uh, in fact, I communicated with them and they had no idea what I was talking about. So it's interesting in that they came to this to this finding that's quite relevant to what I'm talking about just by looking at something else. They're interested in the role of the brain in regulating uh, physiological process related to metabolism in the periphery, in the, in the digestive system. And they wanted to show that the uh, BLA has a function on that. And so one of the things they did is to train animals to lick uh, sucrose and then shift them to water. Now sucrose to water is also a uh, word downshift. Think of it as consumatory extinction, right? You get the water together with the sucrose in, in training, and then you get, you get just the water in, in, uh, in the test trial. And they also had a condition that involved in saccharine that uh, we're not interested in. But we're interested in this transition from sucrose to water. And the behavior is what you would expect. These, these, are, uh, uh, these animals suppress, suppress the intake of the solution when they go from sucrose to water. But what is really interesting is this. When they looked at the BLA, they detected a population of neurons that selectively respond in animals that have experienced the downshift. And this is what we had anticipated in 2017 when we published that paper involving um, uh, ex ex excitotoxic lesions of the BLA. Because of data that we collected, we were thinking that there should be neurons there that uh, compare the two solutions. And maybe this would be evidence for that. The experiments are not yet in, in a stage that they, they feel safe about publishing them. So they haven't been reviewed, peer reviewed yet, uh, but this is to, to me, this is very encouraging. It suggests that 
Indeed, there, there might be a population of cells in the BLA that get activated selectively when the animal experiences downshift. All right, so because of other data, we know that these, these large nuclei in the amygdala are heterogeneous. Not only they have different populations of neurons, but their anatomical location is, uh, it has differential functionality. So we can discriminate between an anterior and posterior BLA, and we can also discriminate between a medial, a capsular, and a lateral central nucleus. And the way this works, uh, this unrelated to contrast, this is more related to the consumption of uh, appetitive and aversive substances like sucrose versus quinine. So we know that, for example, the posterior BLA is connected to appetitive responses through connections with the medial and lateral central nucleus, and also through connections with the nucleus accumbens. On the other hand, we know that when you give the animals quinine, the anterior BLA is responding, and its connections to the capsular region of the central nucleus is what tags these events as aversive. So we were thinking that contrast being negative contrast being an aversive situation should selectively activate the anterior portion of the BLA and also selectively activate the capsular region of the central amygdala. We, we didn't have, all the evidence that we had was not selective enough to, to let us know whether this was the case. For example, when, you, when we did lesions of the BLA, we lesion extensively. The same is true for the central amygdala, we and others. Uh, have uh, have produced lesions that are so extensive that you, you can't you can't really tell apart different subregions. So we decided to tackle this uh, using uh, CFOS expression because that will allow us to get at very discrete anatomically discrete regions of the amygdala and uh, and look at what what they are how they are responding in uh, conditions involving downshift versus control conditions uh, involving downshift. And, oh yeah, by the way, there's a weak connection between the anterior BLA and the accumbens, which is also connected to aversive uh, responses. All right, so this is research that we've done uh, last summer um, with uh, David Arjol from the University of Seville, who was visiting my lab, and Tony Agüera, from the University of Jaén and Chris Hagen, who's a, a graduate student in my lab. And we done, we have trained animals under three conditions, uh, downshifting from 32 to two, that's, that's an extreme downshift. Downshifting from eight to two, that's a mild downshift. And then keeping them at 2% all the time, that's a, that's a, an unshifted control. And we, we, uh, we, uh, run just a single session, because again, we're interested in what triggers this initial rejection of the downshifted solution. So we, we looked at uh, just one session and then we perfused the animals, the brains were extracted, uh, immunohistochemistry, process, procedures for CFOS expression, and then IMAJ for cell counting were implemented. And we did that with, a, with, with 30 different subregions of the amygdala in mind. So we, we have various regions of the three main locations. That's the base, basal, lateral, central, and medial amygdalas. Those are the three major sections. But we look at subregions within these three. And also we looked at the anterior posterior axis. And so we came out with 30 different areas to look for. And these are, these are the areas. So for each area, we have an anterior, medial, and posterior section. And this will be the lateral amygdala, this will be the lateral basal amygdala, and so on. And so what did we find? Well, first of all, behavior, right? Because you always have to start with behavior. We got a huge response suppression. This is pre versus post shift. A huge response suppression in the 32 to two condition. And we had a milder suppression when you go from 8% to 2% sucrose. It's still significant, but it's milder. And we have no changes in behavior when you stay at 2%. And notice that the uh, 
to response to 2% in the downshifted animals is significantly different from the response to 2% in the unshifted controls. That's the SNC effect, that difference. And notice also that the A to 2 downshift doesn't produce significant suppression. So you have suppression, it doesn't pro it produces significant suppression, but it does not produce evidence of SNC because this func this bar here is at the same level as this one here, this control. So to get contrast, you have to go below this. I hope that's clear. All right, so we have suppression in both conditions of, um, of downshift, but we have contrast in only one of them, in the one that's more drastic from 32 to two, and no evidence of contrast in the A to two uh, transition. So what happened with the CFOS expression? Here are all the data, and I'm sure you cannot see this, so I have uh, more detailed um, slides. We are interested only in areas in which we have differences between the 32 to two and the two two. And there, there are only four areas. In among the 30 areas that we looked at, there's only four areas that meet that uh, meet that uh, criterion. The eight to two uh, downshift never produced more activation than the unshifted controls. So we, uh, we leave that on the side. So what are the areas that we're looking at? When it comes to the BLA, we looked at the uh, lateral basal amygdala, the anterior in the in the uh, uh, anterior posterior axis, the anterior and the medial portions of the BLA, of, of the lateral basal amygdala, produce significantly more expression in the downshifted animals than in the down, than in the uh, uh, the the ones that uh, experience a, a smaller downshift, but also the ones that are, uh, the unshifted controls. So we have uh, here detected two regions. In the uh, central amygdala, we detected one region. Uh, in the uh, in the capsular region, uh, in the uh, in terms of the anterior posterior axis, the the medial portion of the uh, of the uh, capsular area, but not in the anterior or posterior capsular amygdala. And in the uh, medial amygdala, we have also detected something in the anterior portion of the anterior ventral medial amygdala. So these four regions are the ones that produce data consistent with, uh, with, with, with the contrast effect at the behavioral level. So here I, I, I brought these pictures just to show you that you have, you have to look at the picture on the left compared to the other two, and especially the left compared to the one in the middle and the, the dark black dots, that's cells, CFOX positive cells, and it's more here than here. This corresponds to the an, an, anterior portion of the lateral amygdala, the lateral basal amygdala. The next one corresponds to the medial portion of the lateral basal amygdala. Again, there's far more expression here than in the controls. Uh, and this one corresponds to the medial capsular central amygdala in the same issue, and this corresponds to the anterior, anterior ventral, uh, medial amygdala, same, the same story here. All right, so we have detected uh, just four areas within the, four, four regions, four, four sub-areas, we could say, within the amygdala that will, uh, that will, will highlight, will get activated by a drastic reduction in reward magnitude. And these, these are the four areas. And they're all located in the anterior or medial portions of the amygdala. Nothing is located in the posterior. So, so let me, let me, I'm about to finish, but I want to go before we are done with these four uh, uh, areas of uh, research, just to consider future things. And the first one I want, the first thing I want to do is to compare that, to go back to that figure that looked at the amygdala in different subsections and see whether what we found is consistent with what the others have found in animals that were looking for sucrose versus quinine. And this is the graph that I showed you before. And we found this, the anterior medial lateral amygdala, basal amygdala, we found to be involved in contrast 
in the medial capsular region of the central amygdala, we found to be involved also in contrast. And there's kind of interesting uh, coincidence here between what they found in terms of taste and what we found in terms of uh, contrast, uh, also involving taste. Um, and that in that the, uh, because contrast is uh, it has to be assumed to be an aversive uh, task, uh, we have coincidence in that we we seem to be activating with contrast the same areas that are activated by exposure to an aversive taste like quinine. Now these areas are so small that I don't think lesion or even threads would be appropriate to test selectively what, what are they doing. The thing to do here would be to either single cell recordings from neurons located in these areas while as the animal undergoes contrast, or perhaps optogenetics, because those techniques are more refined in terms of the spatial location. You can, you can, you can control that much, much better than you can with uh, the techniques that we use. So, so this this remains to be to be seen. This evidence remains to be collected. Um, what else? Well, we like to think that contrast, the way we study contrast, uh, is very restrictive because the animal can either lick or sucrose or not lick, do something else. And that we, that's a, that's called a forced choice. Either do either uh, either approach the only option that's there, or or not. Um, but that's not a, uh, it's not a true free choice situation. So we have developed a situation based on outer shaping, a Pavlovian procedure um, that involves force and three choices. And we know that when you offer a rat a forced choice, when just a single lever is present at a time. And you give you associate that lever. This is out of shaping, so it's a Pavlovian procedure. Uh, you associate the presentation of that lever with either the delivery of twelve pellets or two pellets, and you look at the amount of lever present that you get. You don't see much there. These are means and um, these are medians actually, and interquartile ranges. So they are very large for that reason. So you don't see any difference there in the pre-shift. You don't see any difference in the post shift when you take the 12 pellet lever and you downshift that to two pellets. So now the two levers are associated to two pellets, but if anything, the animals in the downshifted condition respond a little more, but it's not significant. So one, one lever at a time produces nothing. And so we, th we, we thought, okay, uh, Shannon Conrad and I thought, what about if you give them a choice, a free choice? And so we, uh, you know, occasionally we give, give them access to two levers in an unreinforced choice trial. And now we get a clear preference for the lever in pre-shift for the lever that delivers 12 pellets over the lever that delivers two pellets, which makes a lot of sense. The same, this will be the uh, absolute value test, right? Uh, you prefer the lever that's associated to the larger amount of food than the lever that's associated to a smaller amount. And the question was, once you do the downshift, and after you go through a, a session with several forced choice trials, at the end, we offer them a choice, uh, a free choice between the two levers. And now to our surprise, what we see is that the uh, choice reverses. And the lever that was preferred before is now rejected in favor of the lever that was actually rejected before. So there's a reversal of choice that characterizes this situation. That reversal is significant. And, uh, and we are in the process of exploring what's going on in the brain when the animal is experiencing this, this downshift in, in, a, in a choice situation. We don't yet know what's gonna happen. We suspect that this situation may be very different. For example, we have now data that's under review that shows that if you do hippocampal uh, inhibitory dreads um, in this situation, you uh, 
in this situation, you get you get perseverance of the pre-shift choice. So animals that uh, have in inhibited hippocampi continue to prefer the liver that used to be associated to the large reward, even though control animals have switched to the other level. Um, but we also know that hippocampal chemogenetic inhibition doesn't do anything to consumatory contrast. So we know that the two consumatory and this, uh, this Pavlovian choice situation do not necessarily have or rest on the same brain processes. So we, we, we have to still determine what's going on here. It might be just that the spatial component is overwhelming and takes over uh, part of the task, and, but all that remains to be seen. It's one area where we need to do more. We need to do more. Um, another area is the comparative area. There is nothing, as far as I can tell, that will tell us anything about the neural basis of uh, SNC in animals other than mammals or rats, really. Uh, in other words, animals that don't produce evidence of contrast, the animals that when you downshift the reward, uh, they just adjust their behavior without overshooting, without uh, excessive uh, excessive uh, exhibition of uh, rejection. But we have some evidence coming from avoidance learning, which is different but related. And we have that in goldfish. And thanks to the work that we have done with uh, Postman Salas and Manolo Portabella and at the University of Seville, and goldfish shelling back and forth to avoid shock, uh, swimming over a barrier to avoid shock, uh, and with lesions in the uh, amygdala homologue, which in, in Telios fish is in the middle section of the telencephala, and areas homologous to the hippocampus that, that's located laterally. Uh, we, we, have, we have done experiments involving avoidance, and we know that the location of the lesion is important because if you're located in the amygdala, then you have a, a deep deficit. The hippocampal analog or hom homolog uh, and sham animals uh, produce the same behavior. So the hippocampus may not be involved in, in avoidance learning, but the amygdala is. And so in animals that can adjust to reward downshift, Will the amygdala be involved in, in those in those animals in that in that sort of behavior? These are animals that don't produce contrast, but do produce adjustment or behavior to changes in reward. Um, we also looked at avoidance behavior in toads in a very different condition. Toads are amphibians, and they are highly dependent upon water to, for survival. And so we have been training toads with a group of colleagues in Argentina. For decades now, we we uh, every time every time we collect new data, there's something surprising. So here is here is an experiment uh, involving avoidance of hypertonic solutions. This is done by this was done by Ruben Musio and Martin Poddington and uh, and others in the um, Institute uh, Institute of uh, Experimental Biology and Experimental Medicine in Buenos Aires. And the situation is very simple. So you get a toad uh, in a two compartment uh, place. If they enter into the compartment labeled here as uh, uh, in gray, um, they will, uh, they will uh, sit because toads drink through a patch of skin, uh, a patch of ventral skin. They sit on the water to drink. They don't drink water through the mouth. And they sit on water that's hypertonic and as a result of that, they get actually they lose weight. They they get dehydrated. They uh, don't like that at all. It's extremely aversive to them, and so they learn to avoid that sort of situation uh, very very fast and very easily. And what we have done is we have collected data from using Agnor is a silver nitrate uh, stain of nucleoli in the neurons located either in the amygdala homolog and the, or the hippocampus homolog. And we found again that the amygdala is involved. Uh, there's more expression in animals that have been exposed to the highly hypertonic solution uh, before. 
versus animals that have been exposed to a, 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 re, a neutral solution. The hippocampus doesn't show that. The amygdala shows that difference. Also the striatum shows that difference. So we have, we have techniques. We have techniques that will allow us to pursue this in a comparative framework. And this research is, it should be extremely important as well as exciting because it will tell us what the evolutionary transitions might have been uh, between, uh, you know, from, from early, early fish and amphibian uh, evolution to the evolution of mammals. Of course, no living amphibian is an ancestor to a living mammal. That's, uh, we have to settle that, but there's no other way to do it than to use live animals to do this research. So at the very best, we can come up with some theories. Uh, I don't think we can demonstrate anything beyond uh, educated guesses about the evolution of learning, how the evolution of uh, these effects. Um, what about applied stuff? Well, the Institute of Mental Health, the National Institute of Mental Health, came up with this research domain criteria approach to, uh, to mental disorders that's based upon a series of, uh, lay a layer series of uh, concepts. Um, it eventually settles on behavioral domains. And among these behavioral domains, there is one that is called, received the name of negative valence domain. And if you look at the components of this domain called behavioral endophenotypes, there are two that caught our attention. One is loss and the other is frustrated non reward. Frustrated non reward involves a loss of reward. So the two are intimately connected. And so now, because of this initiative, the idea here is that behavioral endophenotypes cut across different kinds of uh, psychiatric disorders in such a way that it, the suggestion is that this is, this is such that it might be more profitable to, con to concentrate our efforts in this behavioral endophenotypes rather than in major, um, major categories of mental disorders. Um, basically, this is what comparative psychologists and behavioral neuroscientists have been doing for a long time. Um, and so this, this makes a lot of sense to most of us. What else can we do with this research? We can do a lot of things. We can have a lot of applications coming from this, but this is just one that I highlight here, um, potentially, right? It's the use of non-invasive brain stimulation therapy procedures, uh, which result in, uh, apparently have some uh, effect in some conditions, like in this case, depression. And of course, to apply this to a person, for example, has, who suffers from some sort of condition derived from uh, extreme loss of, of, uh, of a, a very extreme loss, from which you cannot recover if you were to apply the, the, uh, this sort of treatment to such a person, such a client, um, you will have to know where to point that, that uh, uh, the neuromodulation therapy in the brain. Where do you, where do you point to? In this case, and you can point to uh, cortical as well as subcortical areas. In this case, they use uh, areas in the prefrontal cortex and here is some indication that it, it was actually effective for patients who suffer from depression. We think that reward loss, particularly in the uh, consumatory uh, procedure, and especially we think in, in terms of not the immediate reaction to the loss, but the anticipatory re response to the loss. When, when the, an animal anticipates failure, uh, failure of reward. Uh, we think that that could be connected to uh, something akin to depression. There is some data suggesting that, for example, aggressive behavior is suppressed in animals that have undergone consumatory extinction and also consumatory contrast. And so there is an idea there that should be pursued that uh, <clears throat> frustration sometimes can lead to aggression and, uh, and various forms of aggression. There's data on that, uh, but sometimes it can lead to depression, to something that looks like, looks like the kind of behavior that you get in rats that are, have been exposed to inescapable shots, in the, like in the learned helplessness uh, paradigm. 
So we think that this, this research could lead to that. It's not my goal to do that, to point to that, but we have to be able to point to potential uh, areas of application. All right, so this is what I have for you. This is an extensive list of people who collaborated in the research that I just showed you from various places, from, from uh, Spain to Japan, uh, to Argentina, to Colombia, and, uh, and of course the US. And this is a uh, list of the funding sources. I appreciate the support that I've gotten here from TCU in my university, uh, and also from NIDA, without which the uh, chemogenetic uh, research couldn't, couldn't have been done. And I want to end by reminding you of the symposium that we're planning for uh, SFN in, in October in Chicago. Um, consider, consider, consider attending to that meeting. And this is all, so I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see you. All right, I hope, I don't see anybody sleeping, so that's good. <laughs>